Mike, thank you. Thank you, sir. I realize I am the obstacle between you and lunch, so I'll try to keep us on time here. Um, I'm Mike Tegman. I uh, currently work at First Watch, a uh, big data analytics organization. I also teach at the uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County's uh, graduate program in emergency health services management, and I'm on the faculty with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, and I'm uh, uh, grateful for uh, several of the previous speakers giving some uh, good references to quality improvement framework. Um, I, I want you to do a quick, uh, quick thing for me. Would you just cross your arms across your chest like this? Uh, and what I'd like you to do is to look down and notice which arm is on top. And just recross your arms with the other arm on top. How does, how does that feel? Some of you can't even figure out how to do it, right? <laughs> why, do, why does that feel weird? I mean, if I would have asked you when you walk in the room, when you cross your arms, which arm do you usually put on top? Unless you've done it, you probably wouldn't even think about it. When you bring something that exists kind of in your normal belief system, your normal actions, it exists at a tacit level, bring it to the surface and then rearrange it, it feels uncomfortable. And when I had breakfast with uh, Barry Fisher, who was the uh, director of the public health department in uh, Ventura County, California, um, who is a, he's a director of the entire health, health department, all the hospitals, all the clinics, all the physicians, um, but he's a, a former uh, street paramedic. And we've been talking about this uh, community paramedicine stuff since we did the first uh, Sand Key uh, conference that was in 1994 in, uh, in Florida. Um, and I'd taken over uh, as the new general manager for AMR's operation in Ventura County. And I said, you remember we've had those conversations I said, those paramedics all report to me now, so what do you actually want to do? And I expected him to say something about CHF uh, readmission reduction or kids' bicycle safety helmets or elderly fall reduction, but instead, uh, uh, at our breakfast at Pete's Breakfast House, he said, I want you to work on tuberculosis. And it felt like the wrong arm was on top. I never thought about it. All I knew about tuberculosis is I got the skin test and my skin tests were negative. Um, uh, tuberculosis is a disease that's been around for a long time. The earliest record of it uh, is in the spine of an Egyptian mummy in uh, 2400 BC. Uh, the father of uh, modern medicine, Hippocrates in 640, said consumption, which is what we used to call tuberculosis, um, is the most widespread disease of our time and it's always been fatal. And he was essentially describing an epidemic of the disease and that epidemic meeting the World Health Organization epidemic criteria continues to this day. Um, one of the objectives of the World Health Organization is to end the tuberculosis epidemic worldwide by 2030. And I believe that um, paramedics, community paramedics, um, can be a contributor uh, to that worldwide effort. Um, uh, the, the bacteria, myobacterium uh, tuberculosis was uh, first identified in 1842. Um, it is the number two killer uh, due to infection worldwide uh, to this day. Uh, there are nine million people a year that come down with the disease. Um, and coming down with the disease is different than having uh, latent tuberculosis. You can have uh, actually a third of people in America, or not in America, in the world, a third of people in the world um, have latent TB. So if you look around the room and it's like, if you don't have it, one of the people sitting next to you um, probably has latent tuberculosis. That means you're probably not infectious. Uh, but 9 million come down with the actual disease of tuberculosis and 1.5 million of those die um, each year at, this, at the current rate. Um, grabbed a little bit of uh, Canadian data since we're in Canada. Um, Canada, along with the rest of the world, has had a dramatic reduction in deaths. In the last 25 years, there's been a 43% uh, reduction in deaths uh, from tuberculosis worldwide with the uh, uh, early identification of the disease and uh, aggressive treatment um, in the last 15 years worldwide, it's estimated that there are close to 50 million lives that have been saved um, through the efforts of, uh, of the practice of good medicine. Uh, most of us think of TB as primarily a pulmonary disease, um, but TB is a, it's a bacteria and it's a really hard to kill bacteria. It has a very thick um, cell wall. Um, while um, most tuberculosis is pulmonary, uh, you can get tuberculosis in your spine, your gut, your testicles. Um, it can end up in, uh, in basically any place where a, a bacteria can colonize within your body. Um, its primary mode of transportation is respiratory. Uh, so for uh, people coughing, 
uh, singing, talking loudly, breathing. Um, it's the primary mode of transmission. It disproportionately, um, disproportionately affects people at the margins of society. Um, think about situations where people share air. So homeless shelters, uh, prison and, uh, and uh, jail circumstances, um, people with compromised immune systems, it's easier for the bug to take hold and grow. A uh, third of the people who um, die from tuberculosis um, actually have uh, HIV uh, worldwide, and it is uh, one of the primarily, primary mecha mechanisms of death uh, for patients with HIV. Um, people with uh, diabetes, uh, people being uh, treated for cancer, um, they're all at higher risk for getting tuberculosis. Um, so we uh, talked about for a minute, the latent tuberculosis means that uh, the, the, the bugs are encapsulated um, in your lungs. They're not growing. They, um, and many people live and die from other causes without having their TB ever become a disease. Um, if it grows to become cavitory or miliary, um, that's where it becomes uh, uh, contagious. Um, uh, and a, a single person can uh, affect, infect a significant number of people. Um, so we uh, put together uh, an, a Ventura County EMS Public Health TB Partnership, um, met with the uh, TB clinic, um, and kind of the first research on this was um, just me going out and riding along with public health nurse, uh, taking care of TB uh, patients in the community to just kind of learn from the front lines how things, uh, how things work from this perspective. Um, very grateful to many of the previous speakers for talking about the IHI. Um, triple AIM and our uh, project was framed within the Triple AIM context. Um, we also, um, I've been involved with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, for 24 years, so we uh, chartered this project uh, within the, the model for improvement. This was created by the Associates of uh, Performance Improvement, a group of statisticians in, in Austin, Texas, and it uh, provides kind of the infrastructure and framework. Uh, for IHI's work worldwide. IHI is uh, at this point in time in uh, 39 countries around the world, including, I believe, all of the countries that are represented in the room. Um, I, many of the people who spoke before me are researchers. Um, I'm an improver. Um, improvers are kind of like the ambulance drivers of the scientific world. Um, we, you know, we've, we've struggled for acceptance. Um, but um, using, uh, using the framework, this, uh, this model for improvement, um, we have uh, worked um, with uh, our uh, colleagues in the United Kingdom and uh, British Medical Journal and have, have come up with uh, peer review guidelines uh, for the publication of healthcare improvement projects um, to meet some level of scientific rigor. They're called the uh, Squire Guidelines. And uh, this project is uh, chartered and been managed within that framework. It's IRB approved, um, all of those kinds of things. So our aim is to decrease the cost and improve the patient experience of patients with tuberculosis in Ventura County, California. Um, the change, our, our theory about how things can improve, and um, one of the uh, things in the improvement world is you got a theory, um, you can test it. Um, the <coughs> theory is that the, our, uh, the, um, the challenge is that the cost to deliver uh, DOT, and, and DOT is directly observed therapy. Um, it is the, the way you uh, treat patients with tuberculosis. Uh, will decrease by 50% and patients will feel like the system uh, takes good care of their needs. Um, the change we um, introduced is to have community paramedics provide directly observed therapy DOT uh, for people with TB in collaboration with the TB clinic. It's not a separate community paramedic program. We uh, look at ourselves as partners and ancillary support to the public uh, health effort. Um, it, I, I got to tell you, I, you know, I, I you know, had this meeting with Barry, I went and rode along with a public health nurse, and I came back uh, to my uh, senior paramedic team, and I said, a great, I got a great idea, we're going to take care of TB patients. Um, what do you think my reception was? They were scared, a little pissed, scared. One of them uh, had a pregnant wife at home. He was terrified about taking uh, tuberculosis home to his wife, and they were worried about an infectious disease. And um, it, through the education process, they figured out that um, they're actually probably more at risk uh, from, of catching tuberculosis from uh, somebody standing uh, in line behind them at the, at the convenience store coughing on them than from taking care of patients who we know their sputum status and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, Ventura County is the first county north of Los Angeles in um, California. Um, the TB clinic is down here in Oxnard, California. 
Um, it's responsible for taking care of patients all over the county. And uh, the management of tuberculosis, well, it, it's a very hard to kill bacteria. So an average routine patient with pulmonary tuberculosis requires daily medication for six months. And the medications are pretty harsh. They're like a low-level form of chemotherapy. So they have a lot of side effects. They're uncomfortable to take. So compliance is challenging. Untreated pulmonary tuberculosis and, and today, this day and age, still has a 90% mortality rate. So if you don't get treated, your chances of dying are 9 out of 10. And it is contagious. It's one of the only diseases in the United States where if you are not compliant with your treatment that they can actually incarcerate you and force you to be cared for. Um, so the, the treatment for folks needs to be uh, delivered daily. And the directly observed therapy means you need to give people their medication, watch them take it, and complete a survey about uh, side effects and uh, signs of malabsorption that can sometimes come along with it. Um, so from the, the TB program's perspective, they'd have patients up in these uh, outlying areas in the county up here. And it would take them, you know, the nurse or the community health worker four hours to drive up, give them their medication and drive back. Not a very efficient use of uh, the system. Our paramedics are, uh, cover the ge geography for the entire county. Um, so that was, the, that was kind of the framework of the plan. Uh, put our paramedics through a pretty extensive training about the disease, um, learning how to manage it. Um, I had them go out and do ride-alongs and, uh, and whatnot with the, the public health nurse. Um, got them uh, plugged in. Uh, we uh, use a, um, an, an app uh, that has been, uh, uh, been developed actually for coordinating kids' soccer teams. Um, but we uh, uh, did it in a HIPAA-compliant manner to coordinate the care so that the uh, physician who's responsible for these patients and the public health nurse and all the community paramedics are able to stay uh, real-time connected with what's happening with these folks. <coughs> medications are given. Um, this is the, the standard routine of medications. This is what most people uh, with TB take. Um, if you miss doses and kind of screw up the treatment process for somebody with tuberculosis, the bacterium uh, can mutate pretty quickly and can become drug resistant. Um, there are about 480,000 people a year worldwide who develop multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, there was a man last year in India who became drug resistant to every known medication uh, for the treatment of tuberculosis and they basically put him in a, a negative pressure isolation room and watched him die because there was nothing that could be done for him. Um, the side effects of these medications are not insignificant. Um, rashes, nausea, vomiting um, can be issues. So uh, part of what we do is we help uh, manage the side effects in order to uh, make sure people get their medication. <coughs> uh, many of these medications are hepatotoxic and cardiotoxic. Uh, so for some of them, we're uh, drawing uh, regular liver enzymes to monitor their liver functions. Um, taking uh, serial 12 leads to see if there are any uh, signs of cardiac to toxicity. And um, since these patients, many of them have uh, a number of comorbidities and we're helping them, you know, it's like you, know, you get to treat the whole person, not just the TB. Um, you've got people who you're teaching them how to take their diabetic medications more correctly, um, helping them learn to manage their blood sugar, a number of uh, different things. And when you get a no exposure, um, when you've got a new patient with uh, tuberculosis, one of the first things, it's like a little bit of a, a CSI investigation where you go find who all they may have exposed uh, to do a contact investigation where you draw blood uh, for a quantifuron test uh, for everybody they've been in contact with. And at, as partners with the health department, uh, when the measles outbreak happened at, uh, at Disneyland a uh, year and a half ago or so, um, one of the uh, patients who had measles uh, was a six-month-old who was seen at a daycare center in our community. And um, the public health nurse who runs our TB program got handed the ball for dealing with the measles outbreak because it's a communicable disease, an area of expertise for her. So I got a call from her at 11 o'clock one evening. And she said, you know, I got to do a contact investigation on a daycare center with 60 kids between six months and four years old that we have to draw blood on and their parents don't know about it yet. It's happening tomorrow morning, can you help? And it's like, well, this is like an MCI. So, you know, I latched onto a batch of our medics and we sent them over and set it up like an MCI and had a, 
a room to draw far away so that the other kids who were waiting their turn to get their blood draw couldn't hear the other ones crying. And we had snacks and juice and uh, some of my medics brought toys from home so that the kids could play and have a playground and a, another area set up to counsel the parents about what was happening. And uh, when the partnerships open up, it, it's just really expanded. Um, a lot of interesting uh, patient cases that uh, seem to really lend themselves well to paramedic style of care. One of our patients is a 40-year-old male. Uh, he's got uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. He's uh, been treated long enough that he's smear negative. He's diabetic, uh, poorly controlled, hemoglobin A1C of 14. He's alcoholic and he's schizophrenic. And um, he lives in a shed behind the house. It's the tool shed. Uh, the people in the house let him in once a week to shower, but they won't let him stay in the house because his schizophrenia makes them too crazy. Um, so this patient needs twice a day DOT, 12 hours apart uh, for six months. So um, our crews will show up and it's like he won't be in the shed. Well, they've, they have figured out which bar he likes to drink at. So they have DOT'd him at the shed, at the bar, and in jail. And they've got, they've kind of, they don't have a GPS tracker on him, but they really know where he is and they can pretty much always find him, which the public health department said we would never have been able to track him and, and do that kind of thing. So some of the paramedic perspectives really help. Since we started the program, we've had uh, 48 patients uh, complete the course of treatment, which means they are cured of the disease. Um, it's not a large number of individual patient, patients, but this uh, uh, represents 9,800 actual patient visits, um, including uh, one patient with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis um, who we treated for uh, uh, two years and two months, uh, twice a day in order to be able to get him through his treatment. Um, oftentimes, uh, we would interrupt him cooking meth in the bathroom um, when, uh, in order to get him to come out and, uh, and, and do his treatment. Um, uh, our project framed around the, the triple aim, so from the population health perspective, um, we're able to provide treatment on weekends and holidays. TB clinic is open, you know, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, we're able to do side effect management very quickly, <coughs> identify and monitor uh, toxicity for these folks. Um, from the patient experience perspective, um, the medications frequently cause nausea, so a number of patients uh, like to be able to take it just before bed so that the nausea effects actually happen during their sleep and don't tend to wake them up. Um, so our ability to provide uh, DOT just before bed uh, better than the, the clinic was an improvement in their care. Um, we also uh, ended up uh, assisting people with uh, food, shelter, uh, diabetes, self-care. Um, we've got one patient uh, currently who um, is uh, functionally illiterate and is a, a fairly brittle diabetic and just can't figure out how to read the TB syringe. Um, so we've actually rearranged the DOT schedule so that we're actually giving him his insulin and his TB meds at the same time. Um, uh, our crews have become very close to many of the patients they took care of and they've <coughs> started a process of completion celebrations. You're uh, uh, free and cured of tuberculosis uh, from the cost um, previously, the, uh, the clinic, uh, when they're using community health workers, community health workers are not licensed to dispense medications. Um, so the medications would be bubble packed. Um, so each medication would be bubble packed in a 30 day uh, bubble pack and you get a stack of four bubble packs of medications. And if you were the patient, I would hand these to you. You would pop the medications out and take them. It costs $10 to bubble pack each medication uh, per month per patient. So those costs were saved. And the uh, overtime for the clinic staff, which had been pretty high before, has uh, vanished um, an estimated saving of $40,000 um, per year in actual real money. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges I've run across in, in looking at community paramedicine stuff is uh, people talk about great cost savings. Um, and I uh, have, have a couple of friends who are, uh, run uh, large services, in, including a couple of municipal fire departments, who made the claims of, you know, we're going we're gonna to save, one of them said, we're going to save $780,000 in cost this year. Um, so the city manager said, uh, great, we're going to reduce your budget by $780,000. And the chief said, well, I didn't mean real money. I didn't, I, that's, uh, that, those are, actually, that's billing avoided. That's $780,000 of billing avoided. There's not, not actual costs. So it's one of the conversations I think it's important for us to think about as we talk about the, the finances related to this stuff. Um, that's the end of this. If you've got any questions, uh, please uh, write down my cell phone number or my email address, 
and uh, fire them off. Thank you.